Hi there, this is um, Mark Grossi from the Digital Compliance Hub. Um, just to let you know that um, I'm recording the session. Um, if you've got any questions, we'll pick those up at the end. In your GoToWebinar control panel, there should be a questions section and you can type in your questions there um, as, as we go through the presentation. And as I say, I'll pick those up at the end. Um, and uh, after the webinar, I'll um, distribute a copy of the slides and also um, a, a link to view the um, recording of the webinar. OK, so um, welcome. Thank you for coming, uh, joining us on this Friday afternoon for a GDPR Basics um, webinar. Um, as I said, my name is Mark Gracie. Um, I run the Digital Compliance Hub, which is a um, GDPR support service. I provide uh, a helpline um, on a subscription basis, um, which is um, uh, unlimited email and phone support with some online resources as well. Um, or I do pay as you go um, help, um, either as an uh, individual particular issue that you've got or um, much more bigger projects and, uh, and, and consultancy. Um, I often get asked um, why i involved in GDPR, how did I get into GDPR? Um, and the quick answer to that is um, I became a data protection officer back in the late 90s when the 1998 Act um, um, came into force, which is probably the, the first sort of modern data protection regulation indeed is what GDPR um, sort of builds upon um, to a certain extent. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, so my uh, data protection experience goes back, um, well, just over 20 years. Um, and uh, when uh, GDPR was published in 2016, I started talking to businesses about it and, and what it would mean. Um, and of course, um, everybody, uh, most people know that uh, GDPR came into force on the, on the 25th of May 2018. So um, we're about a year and a half in um, and um, there's still obviously uh, lots to learn about GDPR um, and uh, and the like. And today's webinar is um, really looking at some of the basics. So some of the key fundamentals about um, what GDPR is about or, or more generally what data protection is about. So um, let's get started um, on that. Um, so let's start with um, a bit about the GDPR in terms of its scope and uh, some of the key data protection definitions. So from a scope point of view, um, just to clarify, because GDPR, um, the General Data Protection Regulation, the R is a regulation, um, and because the regulation it's a regulation from an EU law point of view, you have regulations or directives. Um, directives are um, basically um, allowed to be implemented by member states, um, which means that they take their own interpretation and introduce it as um, uh, an, an act of law. So the last data protection um, legislation from the EU was a directive, and that's what led to the Data Protection Act 1998. Because the GDPR is um, a regulation, um, EU regulations apply across the whole of Europe, so it applies to all member states regardless of any national laws, um, and that was really the concept of GDPR was to uh, be uh, clear across all member states in the EU, um, a, a, a sort of a baseline of um, coverage for data protection compliance. So under the previous regime, somebody in the UK wouldn't necessarily know that their data was going to be processed slightly differently if it was processed in France, Germany, Spain, Poland or wherever. Um, under GDPR, we all now know across Europe, regardless of where in Europe we are, that our data will be um, processed according to the standards of, of GDPR. So we in the UK have um, EU GDPR. Um, if we end up Brexiting at some point, um, it's likely we'll have a UK GDPR, which will be um, at least to start off with an exact replication of EU GDPR. But so we'll just talk about GDPR in general and in a post-Brexit world, GDPR will still apply um, just some nuances around uh, data flows and things like that, but uh, um, uh, please join or look look on uh, Digital Compliance Hub for um, some recordings of webinars where I've talked about Brexit and what that could me mean from, from that angle. So GDPR is a, a, a European-wide regulation, um, but in the UK we also have um, the Data Protection Act 2018, and that implements a, a number of pieces of legislation. It essentially says GDPR applies. Um, whilst GDPR is a blanket coverage across the whole of Europe, there's um, small 
things that are allowed to be determined by um, national laws. So, for example, there's some exemptions to the subject access right. Um, there's some exemptions around um, other parts of data protection, um, the definition of the age of a child when it comes to um, seeking consent, um, for example, can be anything from 13 upwards. Um, in the UK, the Data Protection Act 2018 implements it as 13, for example. So where there are exemptions or um, what's called derogations, which is where the member states are allowed to have slightly different rules, um, then there's, uh, we have ours in the Data Protection Act 2018. And, and it also implements some other things around law enforcement, the uh, power of the ICO and, and, um, and so on. Um, and talking of the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, they're the regulator that enforces um, GDPR. They also enforce the rules around um, the privacy regulations, which is uh, privacy electronic communication regulations in the, in the UK. Um, and at a European level, the um, sort of overseeing uh, governance body is called the European Data Protection Board. Um, so both the ICO and the EDPB, the European Data Protection Board, um, produce guidance and um, interpretations of certain elements of uh, data protection. So those are two bodies that is worth paying attention to in terms of what they, um, they set out. Now, when we're talking about data protection, um, we have um, quite a lot of different definitions, but probably um, this sort of circle diagram here covers the basic key definitions that you should be aware of. So data protection applies to personal data and personal data is any data that identifies directly or indirectly to an individual that enables you to identify them. But it also means information about them uh, would could or potentially form their personal data as, as well. So the indirect and direct aspect of it is if you've got a, a name, address and a telephone number, that's clearly personal um, data because you can identify the individual because you've got their name and their telephone number is associated to that record. Therefore, that's personal data as well. If you have another database that doesn't have a name and, and specific details about the individual, but has a say an identifier like a customer number um, and you can cross reference that customer number with another set of data that says customer number one is Fred Bloggs, then it makes both pots of data personal data. So the record that says Fred Bloggs is customer number one is personal data because it's identifying Fred Bloggs, but the other set of data that says customer number one and some other details um, but doesn't say Fred Bloggs is still personal data because you are able to uh, convert that data into uh, identifiable information about the individual. There's also a category of data called special category data um, which used to be called sensitive data, but um, in, in essence, it's uh, things like health information, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, trade union membership, biometric data uh, used for identification purposes, genetic data, um, and, and so on. So these are more sensitive in the sense that um, people will be more protective of um, that data, um, and you are expected to be, if you're processing any of those data, so if you're, say for example, a care home and you're processing medical information about um, one of your care patients, then you are processing special category of data as well as um, ordinary personal data. Um, and the GDPR has some special uh, requirements or conditions, which we'll talk about a bit later um, uh, with regards to special category of data. Um, ironically, lots of people think that financial information like credit card numbers, bank details, that kind of thing is, is sensitive. Well, it is sensitive. So, um, you know, financially sensitive for, for sure, but it's not defined. At, um, well, sorry, that kind of data isn't defined as special category. So it's just treated as ordinary personal data as far as the law is concerned. Now, everything you do with the data is referred to as processing. Um, and that literally is everything. So it's not the reason, just the reason why you've got the data in the first place, but it's the storing, the editing, the manipulating, the sharing, um, literally anything you do with a piece of personal data is referred to as processing. And it's important to remember that wider definition because um, it has implications in some of the um, lawful uh, bases of processing and, and various other aspects of GDPR, which um, will sort of come up out as we go through. And then the, you've got the three key players. You've got the data subject, the data controller, and the data processor. The data subject is the individual whose personal data it is that's being processed. The data controller is the organization who has collected and is determining how that data and um, that personal data of the data subject is being processed. Um, but if the data controller passes that data to a third party to do some processing for them, then um, that is, um, organization is referred to as a data processor. So in a very simplistic uh, example, 
Um, you collect um, email addresses um, to send out marketing messages from your um, from your leads or your customers or from individuals. Those email addresses are personal data of the data subject. You are determining what you're going to do with them. Are you going to uh, use them for email marketing, which makes you the data controller? But if you pass um, your email list to a third party uh, marketing company and say, I'd like you to send out marketing messages for me to my customers and here are, here are the email addresses, they are your data processor. So you still have control over what happens with that data. The data processor is just processing that data on your behalf. So, so those are the key definitions. Um, next thing to think about are the GDPR principles. So these, in essence, are the rules that you have to abide by when it comes to processing personal data. So all processing has to be lawful, fair and transparent. Um, lawfulness in terms of what's lawful for the, um, you know, for processing purposes um, is uh, coming up in a moment. So I'll talk about the lawful basis of processing in a second. Um, and all of your activities with personal data, you have to be basically um, uh, uh, transparent in the sense that um, people should understand um, how you're going to be processing the data and it needs to be fair. So there should be any shocks to data subjects to find that you're processing their data in a, in a particular way. The data you're processing has to be processed for the purpose for which you collected it or you, are, you have it in the first place. Uh, if you want to use it for something different than the reason why you've got it in the first place, then you have to look to see whether another lawful basis for processing um, applies and um, you, know, you might need to use consent, for example, to ask them if you can use it in a different way but you should only process the data for the purpose for which somebody is expecting you to be processing it. Um, the data you collect or process has to be relevant, so you don't ask for data just in case, you have to only ask for the minimum amount of data that you need for, for the processing purposes. You have to keep that data accurate and up to date, so if somebody tells you that their postal address has changed and it's important that you've got that um, detail, you need to make sure all of your records relating to that. And indeed, if you've told any third party processors or other third parties um, you need to, um, about the data for that person, you need to tell them about the changes as well. Um, you should only keep the data for as long as you have a lawful basis for, for doing so. If you don't need the data anymore and there's no other requirement for you to keep the data, then you should be deleting that data um, as soon as you no longer need it. Um, so uh, that's all about data retention. Um, and then um, I was going to say finally, but obviously there's another one at the bottom. But um, on that block of six at the top, um, we've got the principle of security, which is often the one that lots of people think about, that all processing has to be done um, securely. And it's up to you to demonstrate that you've applied appropriate organisational and technological um, measures to ensure the security of all processing. Remembering that wider definition of processing will mean you, your, your actual processing has to be done securely, your storing has to be secure, your sharing has to be secure, your accessing to the data has to be secure and, and so on. Now the GDPR introduced, um, so, so those six um, principles haven't really changed that much since the old um, uh, 1998 GDPR, uh, sorry, Data Protection Act. Um, but what the GDPR introduced was a new principle, the principle of accountability. Um, and it, basically, that is um, a rule that says it's not good enough that you think you're compliant. You have to be able to prove it as well. And there's various documentary and other controls and requirements um, which will sort of crop up as we go through um, that fall within this um, realm of accountability. Now, interestingly enough, the Information Commissioner said earlier this year that of all the data protection principles and the GDPR implementation, the key thing that, that she felt that um, she wasn't seeing in organisations was true adaption of um, the accountability principle and being able to prove um, all your, your, you know, your thoughts, the reasons why you're processing data and, and your documentation and, and so on. So accountability is a very important one and because the Information Commissioner has said things like they don't think that accountability is um, sort of being implemented appropriately, um, then um, we're probably likely to see um, sort of some action or activity um, going forward um, in that particular area. It, it, indeed, actually, the Information Commissioner's Office are currently consulting on a uh, accountability toolkit um, that we might see at some point in uh, 2020 um, with um, sort of uh, 
I guess, a bit more detailed guidance and, and some of the things that we can use to help us um, meet the accountability principles. So those are the principles of, of data protection, the rules that tell you what you, you can and can't do with, uh, or the rules you have to apply basically to your processing. Um, now, when it comes to your processing being lawful, we have a set of lawful bases for processing. So there are six lawful bases for processing. Probably the well-known one is consent. Um, we've probably all suffered uh, consent fatigue in the lead, lead up to the uh, May uh, deadline in 2018, where we're all being inundated by these emails saying, um, we want you on our mailing list still, can you give us consent to carry on sending you marketing messages? And, um, and there was a lot of misunderstanding. Um, people's uh, email lists were decimated and, um, uh, and they started from scratch and they were asking consent in areas where they probably didn't need to in the first place. Um, so the thing about consent is you're basically asking for permission um, to process the data, but just because it's the one that lots of people think about, um, it's the top of the list in terms of it's the first one mentioned in the, in the regulation, doesn't necessarily mean it's the most appropriate one. And the key thing about lawful basis of processing is you have to find the most appropriate from the outset um, lawful basis for processing. So don't automatically default to consent. And, and probably the best way of thinking about consent is it's a very binary option. It's either a yes or no. Yes, you can do this with my data. No, you can't. Um, so if you need to do something and you think you need to ask for consent, you have to live with the consequences of somebody saying no. Um, you also have to live with the consequences of somebody having said yes, changing their mind and now saying no, because everybody has a right to withdraw consent when consent is the lawful basis for processing. Um, if you are relying or needing to use consent, um, then GDPR up the game in terms of what G um, consent should look like. It has to be, um, you have to be basically very open and transparent so that somebody can make an informed decision about what you're uh, asking them to consent to. Um, and they have to take a positive action to actually give you that consent. Um, and so um, you can't have pre-tick boxes anymore. You can't have complicated wording that tries to trick people into being not sure whether they're supposed to tick a box or untick a box. Um, in a general sense, consent has to be no pre-tick boxes, um, very open and transparent about why you want the data and, and what you're going to be doing with it. And, and as I say, the positive action of somebody saying, yes, I give you consent to do this with my data. Um, and you might have to sort of break down the different things you might want to do with the data um, so that they can choose the, the bits that they're happy to give you consent for. And because of the accountability principle, you also need to be able to demonstrate that you were given that consent. So you need to be able to say, well, the consent was collected through this mechanism at this particular time. And um, as far as we know, somebody hasn't told us to uh, withdraw their consent. So, that, so that's consent. As I said, just because it's the first one on my list and uh, people tend to think about consent doesn't mean it's um, the most appropriate. Um, you certainly shouldn't be collecting data for the purposes of delivering a service and asking consent to actually process the data for the delivery of that service because the next lawful basis of processing is what that's for. So if you collect data because you um, need that data to deliver a service or the performance of a contract, then that is your lawful basis for processing. So you don't need to ask consent as, as, as well. Um, just sorry, just going back to consent, because there's a good example. If um, remember, I said about the, the binary yes or no. Well, if you um, if you need to do credit checks, for example, and that's a standard practice of your your organization, then um, you don't want to ask consent, because if somebody asks for consent and, and they say no, you then can't run the credit check. So if that's against your um, the way you operate your business and you still need to run the credit check, then you're in breach of the law because somebody said, no, don't run a credit check and you're still doing it anyway. So you'd have to look and see, well, what is um, the most appropriate lawful basis for me running the credit check if it's not consent? Well, actually, it might be a requirement of a contract, but it's probably the one right at the bottom, legitimate interest, which we'll come to in a moment. So um, as I say, it's important not to automatically assume that consent is um, for everything. Um, and uh, the performance of a contract um, lawful basis is all about the data you have for the basis of either setting up a, a, um, a service or um, providing a product or um, uh, needed to actually deliver on a contract that somebody signed up to. You may be required by law, um, which is legal obligation, um, to process data. 
And so, for example, Taxman says you need to be able to demonstrate um, that you're paying the right taxes um, and you've got, um, you know, they can take action. Um, you need, well, basically, you need to store six to seven years worth of um, uh, data that enables you to be able to prove that um, you're paying the right tax or VAT or, or whatever. So you might not need a customer's data or a copy of an invoice for the for a, a customer that's got their name and address on, on it um, for more than um, the, the delivery of the service that you gave at that particular time. But the taxman says you need to keep your data to prove that you um, you know you were paid, and that might involve using this invoice, and therefore your legal obligation to keep that invoice for up to seven years um, becomes your lawful basis for processing. So uh, if you're in a regulated sector or if there are other rules that apply um, to the uh, particular processing of data or the retention of data, then legal obligation is likely to be your lawful basis for processing um, outside of why you might have the data for other reasons. Um, it's awful, also lawful if you're processing the data in the interests of the data subject. And this is very much sort of life and death. So this is, um, you know, don't uh, if somebody collapses at work, um, don't think about whether you can give out information about who they are and um, what you might know about them to help a paramedic um, because you're not sure whether you need consent or um, whether it's a legal obligation or, or whatever. And um, basically you can give that information out because you're doing so to help the, uh, the employee um, or the colleague. Um, so in a life or death scenario, if you can, uh, you're allowed to process data if it protects the interests of the data subject. If you're a, a, a public body, um, you can carry out um, processing um, as a public task um, or in the public interest. So what that means is um, if you are a public body, you might be processing data because in delivering your duties, you, you need to process data in, in that particular way. So, for example, schools uh, and universities claim um, that the processing of, of student information is needed for the purposes of uh, carrying out their public task of providing education to uh, young people. Um, for example, um, governments might also process data for anti-terrorism purposes and, and various other, other things all in the public interest. Um, and then finally, we have what's called a legitimate interest. Um, so on paper, this sounds like the solution to everything, because if you can say, well, I've got a legitimate interest to grow my business and process the data in this particular way, then that sounds as though that's the answer. But actually, it's not that straightforward. You um, must be sure that um, the law doesn't tell you you can't process the data that way and um, so the processing has to be lawful or legitimate um, if there is a alternative lawful basis for processing that probably applies then you should be relying on that rather than trying to skirt around any any sort of the consent rules or anything um, by using legitimate interest for example um, your processing has to be necessary for the reasons for which you want to process it so you would need to be able to demonstrate that yeah, if you didn't process the data in that way, then um, you know you were, um, it was absolutely necessary that you process the data as a legitimate interest. Otherwise, something wouldn't happen, and what the consequences of of not uh, of that processing not happening. And, and finally, you also have to be sure that the processing you're doing is not um, detrimental to the rights and freedoms of the data subject. So, if the data subject is likely to say, actually, I don't want you to process this in my data because I'm worried about um, X, Y, and Z, then that sounds like a reason why legitimate interest wouldn't wouldn't uh, apply. So there's a tool called a legitimate interest assessment. You can download a template from the Information Commissioner's website about it, um, which has basically got this three-point test, and it enables you to document. So again, this is accountability at work, and um, document that you've considered that you really do need to process it, that it is lawful, and that it's a legitimate reason for you to do so, and that it's not harmful to the to the data subject from from that processing. So uh, whilst, it, as I say, it sounds on paper like it's the solution to everything, why worry about all the others when we can claim legitimate interest? It's not that straightforward um, and you would need to be able to demonstrate that you think legitimate interest is the, the right lawful basis for processing. So those are the lawful bases for processing uh, personal data in general. Those laws also apply to special category of data and, and um, there's another set of data which I didn't mention earlier, which is criminal offence data as well as a lawful basis um, applying. Um, if you're dealing with special category or criminal offence data, then there are another set of rules that need to apply. So, um, for example, the Article 9 conditions of GDPR set out another set of rules. So as well as a lawful basis, you need to meet one of the uh, 
special category data conditions um, for processing and there's uh, I think it's about 15 of them um, and they range from you've got explicit consent which means it's it's, it's written down and, and very clear that somebody has told you yes absolutely process my data in this way and you're doing it for research purposes or whatever and you're doing it in the in the um, in the realms of it, uh, employment or or health uh, health uh, you know providing health services and, and, and such like um, so you need to make sure there's two things to apply if you're going to be processing special category of data and if you happen to be processing criminal offence data and it's worth bearing in mind that you know if you're doing checks on drivers for for company vans or cars for example and you've got um, you do DVLA checks for um, driving offences then you're still processing criminal offence data um, as well as things like carrying out DBS checks and safeguarding checks for uh, uh, you know maybe people who work with children or vulnerable adults. So if you're processing criminal offence data, it has to be a lawful basis of apply, um, and you also need to make sure that um, a separate condition for criminal offence data covered by Schedule One of the Data Protection Act 2018 also applies. Um, and one of the other key things you'll probably need to do in the Data Protection Act. 2018 sets this out. So this is a good example of some additional um, protections that the uh, Data Protection Act um, introduces outside of GDPR. Um, then you may also require to have a policy document that demonstrates how you manage that data, why you manage it, and, and so on. And there's some other rules like you can't keep registers of um, or records of offence data and, and so on unless you're doing so in an official capacity. So, um, yeah, so as well as the lawful basis for processing, which applies to all data, if you're processing special category data or criminal offence data, then you've got to think about some other rules um, that apply as well. Right, so those are the, as you saw, so you had the principles, which are the rules. We've got the lawful basis, which is what makes it lawful for you to do the processing. Um, your data subjects um, have rights, and so we're going to talk now about the eight, uh, well, set, sorry, seven um, individuals' rights. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them in a lot of detail, but um, uh, I'll talk about some of them in, a, um, in, in the sense that, um, um, in the sense of the ones that are, are probably you're more likely to come across. Um, so, individuals' rights, these are the rights that apply to the data subject. Not all of them are absolute, some of them will vary depending on what you're doing with the data and the circumstances, um, but um, it basically means that um, you need to be aware of these rights because you might have duties and, and expectations to set for the, uh, uh, for the individual data subject. So um, you've probably all seen privacy policies, uh, you've probably worried about privacy policy for yourself, this comes out of the right to be informed. So every data subject has an absolute right to understand how their data is going to be, you know, why you're collecting data, how you process it, why you're going to be processing it, what their rights are, how they can complain, how they can contact you about concerns and, and so on. Um, and that's why we have privacy notices or privacy statements or privacy policies. It doesn't matter what the name is, they're all the same thing. Um, and you need to uh, basically ensure that if you're collecting data from an individual, they can find out how you're going to be, why you're collecting that data, how you're going to be using it, and so on. So you can sign, should signpost people to your uh, privacy policy, or if it's a sort of a one-off situation, um, you know, you might see a form, for example, that says all the data collected on this form is being used for this specific purpose. If you want to know anything more about any um, any other kind of way that we process data or how you how we protect data, um, have a look at our privacy policy. So the right, of, right to be informed is all about making sure the individual understands what's happening with their data. Uh, if, you, um, that's, if, if you're collecting data from, um, from the individual directly, then there's certain things you have to um, set out. Um, if you get the data from a third party um, and you're going to be the data controller, you, you need to ensure that you uh, communicate within one month that you have their data and how you're going to be using it. So uh, for example, if you buy in a, a, an email marketing list um, and you've got identifiable individuals on that list, um, you should, within a month, contact them if you're not doing the marketing to them in, the, in that month period um, to say that you've got their data and that it's going to be used for marketing purposes, how you got it, and, and so on. So that's the right to be informed. Um, another well-known one uh, existed in the um, old data protection regime is the subject access right or the right of access. So this gives the data subjects um, 
an absolute right that they're entitled to find out what data you hold on them, how you're processing it, and for you to provide them with a copy. And there's a few other bits and pieces that have to be um, given to them, like how they can complain and, 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 and uh, things like that. Um, this has to be done within a month, and this is a calendar month. So if you get served a subject access on the 29th of January, you've got until the 28th of February, unless it's a sleep year, in which case you've got till the 29th of February. So it's always the same day of the following month that you have to deal with it. So it's not necessarily 30 days or 28 days or however you want to think about it. Um, and you have to provide that information for free. And they are generally a bit of a nuisance because usually somebody has an issue or is aggravated and that's what's causing them to serve a subject access right. And they can be as broad as I want all the data that you hold on me and you have to be able to demonstrate that you've taken uh, as much sort of proportional effort in, in locating the data and supplying it to them. Um, you have to make sure that you're supplying it to the actual person who is the subject, so you don't supply any third party data. So you might have to do some redaction and, uh, and take out third party data as well. Um, so there's quite a, 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 quite a complex set of rules around the right of um, access. And indeed, the Information Commissioner has, has drafted some um, detailed guidance on it, which it's currently consulting on. Uh, the right of rectification, rectifi the right to rectification, um, is a right to enable somebody to say that their data's changed and they want it corrected or or, or changed. Or sorry, their data's changed, which goes with the uh, the principle of keeping data up to date. Um, but also, they can say actually the data you've got on me is wrong. You need to update it. Um, and so everybody has a right to rectification. Um, the right to erasure got quite a a bit of a PR thing going in the in the lead up to GDPR. Um, or the right to be forgotten, as it's uh, also known. Um, this is a right that essentially says a data subject can say, I don't want you to have my data anymore, and I want you to delete it. But this isn't an absolute right. So unlike the right of access, which is an absolute right, the right of erasure isn't absolute, because if you have a lawful reason to continue processing the data, then um, you shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't, you should tell them basically you're not going to delete it and explain um, why. So, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I guess slightly tongue-in-cheek example, um, somebody can't say to you delete all my billing information so that you can't bill me, you can say no, we've got a contract, I was supposed to be billing you, um, I, you know, my lawful basis for processing is um, uh, for performance of a contract, therefore I'm not deleting the data. So it's that kind of um, sort of consideration that you can put to it, as I say, it's not an absolute right. Um, there's a right to restrict processing, so somebody can tell you to stop processing at the moment because they think that there's something you you know you might be acting unlawfully or they've got some concerns. The right to data portability uh, in, uh, entitles somebody um, who has given you data, so they've provided data for a say a service, and they've got a right to ask you for a machine readable export of that data so that it can be imported into a different system uh, uh, to enable swapping between competitors or or whatever. Um, and then finally, the right to object. So there's an an absolute right um, to um, object, object to processing. Now I've just spotted that there's actually supposed to be another one on the end, which is why I said there was eight, but then saw that there were seven on the slide. So apologies, there's an eighth one, which is um, rights relating to automated decision making and profiling. Um, so if you are doing processing where, say, artificial intelligence or some kind of computer system is making a decision on the processing of data, which um, has an impact on what might happen for the individual because of that processing, um, somebody has a right to say, I object to that that, um, that activity, and I would like a human to actually process it. Um, so apologies, that's missing from there. I'm not quite sure how that disappeared. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, there are eight uh, individual rights, um, and the right to object to automated decision-making um, and profiling is is uh, the last one that's not actually on that list, but um, I'll add it to the list and uh, for the slide pack, um, which I'll distribute uh, um, afterwards. Right, so those are the rights. These are the individuals' um, data subjects' uh, rights. Um, there's some other rules and, and controls as well. Um, so let's talk about um, restricted or non-EEA uh, transfers, so that means processing data outside the EU as well as some uh, additional countries um, that are considered the uh, that are considered within the European Economic Area. Um, now you might be thinking, 
why is he talking about data um this doesn't care about, um, sorry data being transferred outside the eu um when we only process data in the uk because it's so this bit's not relevant to us well actually think about that wider definition of processing and where you might be processing your data so if you store your data for example in an excel spreadsheet and stick it on dropbox um, where is Dropbox's data being, or where's your data being stored with Dropbox? Well, there's a good chance that it's being stored in, say, the United States. Well, then you're transferring your data outside of the EU because that data is sitting um, and on Dropbox server in the US. Um, similarly for, um, you know, other other solutions as well. If you use a CRM, for example, like somewhere like HubSpot, um, unless you've configured it to say otherwise, there's a chance that that data is being stored in the US. So you are therefore processing data outside the EU. So the rules um, on the face of it are quite straightforward. It can get quite complicated when you're dealing with different parties, but um, essentially it's okay to transfer data within um, the EEA. So um, provided, um, you know, so you could, if you need to process your data in France and you can do so because we're all part of the EU, um, there will obviously be some implications in a post-Brexit world to all of this, but um, uh, I, I won't get into the complications of that uh, at this point. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if you can transfer data to another EU country, essentially, um, if it goes outside of the EU, but to a country where the EU has decided that they have adequate data protection or there's been what's called an adequacy decision against that country, then that is also OK. So, for example, in 2019, um, Japan, um, successfully completed the process, which is quite a long, drawn-out process. I think it takes a, a couple of years to actually reach an adequacy decision. But um, Japan has been decreed as having adequate data protections. So that means you can process data in Japan without worrying about the consequences of your um, data being misused because Jap Japanese data protection law is, is adequate uh, in comparison to EU data protection law. If, they, if a country doesn't have adequacy decisions, so somewhere like the um, United States, for example, doesn't have adequate data protection according to the EU, then you can look at um, whether there's any other kind of agreements or safeguards that are in place. Now, I mentioned the US on purpose because there is a EU-US agreement which is called Privacy Shield. There's a similar agreement with Switzerland as well, um, which basically uh, US companies can sign up to. They, they basically self-certify um, that they are um, signed up to Privacy Shield and that they will apply European standards of data protection to um, the processing of EU citizens' data. Um, so if you are processing your data with MailChimp because you're running a mail, li mail list uh, on it or Dropbox or something like that, then you need to be looking to see, well, if the data's in the US, are they signed up to Privacy Shield? If they're not signed up to Privacy Shield or they're in a country that doesn't have adequacy decision or there is no agreement in place, um, then you are limited to uh, basically le legally binding contracts. And there's a, th a thing called a standard contract clause, which has to be uh, cut and paste from a EU regulation um, and added to a contract uh, that's put in place between the controller and the processor. Um, and so if you were to say, if we were to say, well, actually, I'm going to um, allow access to my customer database to an Indian call center. Um, India is not in the EU, as you may have noticed. Um, there is an adequacy decision against uh, India. There is no separate agreement with India around the processing of European citizen data. Um, and so the only option is to make sure you have one of these standard contract clauses in the agreement with the Indian call center. Um, and that's all about making sure that they, you're basically binding them legally to um, a contract that says they will apply European citizens data, sorry, European standards of uh, data protection uh, to the processing of your data. Okay, so let's move on. I, I'm sort of rattling through this because I noticed that uh, time is uh, speeding up um, and uh, I want to sort of give some time for a Q&A at the end. Um, so accountability, remember that principle that's been introduced with GDPR, that um, it's not good enough, you're, you're compliant, you've got to prove it as well. Well, there's various different things that need to be done when it comes to meeting that accountability uh, principle. So um, one of the things you've probably heard about is whether you need a data protection officer or a DPO. Um, there are certain requirements. Uh, so public bodies have to have a DPO. They've got no choice. The law says that they have to have one. Um, if you process large quantities of data that enables you to track or monitor behaviors of data subjects, or if you're processing large quantities of special category of data, 
um, and you would have to prove whether you think it is you are doing large quantities or not, um, then you may need to have a data protection officer mandated by law. So as I say, public bodies are mandated by law to have a data protection officer. Um, that person can be um, internal or external. Um, I, for example, provide outsourced data protection officer services, and that's to organisations who are mandated by law to have a data protection officer, and I take care of that, that particular role within their organisation for them. But they have to be essentially independent and allowed to get on with their job um, so that uh, they can actually ensure and enforce data protection compliance across the uh, organisation. If you don't need a data protection officer, and most organisations, unless you're a public body, probably don't, or unless you're, you meet the criteria for large quantities of special category or, or, or um, you're monitoring behaviours of data subjects, um, it's always worth having somebody who takes on the non-mandated role of, of being a data protection officer or a data protection manager, because they can act as a single point of contact for your uh, employees within your organisation um, and uh, they don't have to be a GDPR expert, but they just need to know that they're, they're the go-to person um, for help um, so they can go and find out and um, uh, get the help that they need if they need help or, or answer the questions or deal with sub, um, subject access requests and, and so on. So it's always useful having a central point of contact within your organisation, whether you're mandated to have a DPO or not. Um, you are required to have um, documented records of your regular data processing activities. So you should be able to demonstrate you know what data you have, how it's being processed, who it relates to, um, where it's being processed and so on. So that's what data audit is all about. If you haven't done one, you need to document, even if it's in a spreadsheet. In fact, the Information Commissioner's Office provides a, a template you can use um, to help record that. Because if you don't know what data you have, how you're processing, etc., how can you be sure you're, you're compliant with um, the processing of that data? Um, I mentioned legitimate interest assessments or LIAs when you're using a legitimate interest as your lawful basis for processing. You should have documentation to demonstrate you've checked that your legitimate interest is indeed legitimate. You should have policies and training across your business because if how, how can you demonstrate you're compliant if your employees don't know anything about the basics of data protection or if they don't have any policies that explain what they can and can't do with personal data. Um, there's also requirements around the use of data processors. So you remember the data processor is an organisation that is um, processing data on the instruction of the controller, but because of the wider definition of processing, um, including sharing and storing and things like that, you, you know, if you're using a third party online system for your HR records or um, you're using a CRM or you're using Dropbox or MailChimp, they're all data processors because they're, you're using their system to manage your data um, and therefore they're processors and you have to carry out due diligence on them and ensure that there's a contract in place. So basically you can't, as a data controller, use a data processor unless you're absolutely happy that that data processor is GDPR compliant and Article 28 of GDPR requires you and it actually dictates the terms of a contract between the controller and the processor. So that's usually what's called a data processing agreement that sets out these specific terms. And they range from things like you will only process data on the data controller's instructions. Um, if you use subprocessors, the data controller's got an option to say they do or don't agree to it. So if they, you say, actually, I'm going to start processing your data with a subprocessor based in India, you can object to that. Um, and uh, very onerous things on the data processor, like um, being able to, the controller being able to appoint somebody to go and audit the, the processor to ensure that they really are GDPR compliant. And when it comes to using those processes, you would have to demonstrate that you've done the due diligence, that you've got this contract in place, and that you're happy that that person, that organization is indeed compliant. So, you know, um, essentially, you might want to ask them once a year to ask them um, to provide evidence that they are GDPR compliant. Do they have an audit plan? Do they have an audit report that somebody has come in and told them that they are, are OK and, and so on? And of course, if you're a processor, then you're on the other side of the fence. And so you've got to expect these kind of questions coming from your data controllers. Um, the concept of data protection by design and default means that you have to take data protection um, from the outset of any project or any processing you're doing. So don't think about it as an afterthought, think about it from the, from the outset um, and carry out what's called a data protection impact assessment, which is essentially a risk assessment. What data are we processing? What are the risks of that processing and how do we mitigate those risks? Um, 
the GDPR talks about data protection impact assessments in very limited circumstances, usually when you're processing high risk data, um, like special category data, for example. But the information commissioner who's had a regime of, of uh, impact assessments for quite some time uh, pre GDPR, um, they say you should do one anyway. So whenever you're doing something new with data or you're um, changing systems or you're going to be processing data in a slightly different way than, than um, you've done before, you need to carry out a data protection impact assessment and that's your evidence that you've carried out a risk assessment and have worked out what the risks are and, and do something about it. You might be bound by sector codes or certif certified schemes that tell you in your, in your industry or sector um, that you must uh, apply best practice or something like that. They might not be legally binding, but if there is a best practice and you're not following it, you would have to answer what to the ICO why you've not been following best practice for your industry. So it's worth paying attention to those. You also need to make sure you can deal with the day-to-day -day compliance, and that's where your single point of contact can come in. So that's like dealing with things like breaches um, and um, uh, so breaches, if you suffer a data breach, you've got 72 hours to consider whether it's reportable to the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, you have to consider whether you have to tell the data subjects as well, and you have to keep a record of that. Um, other things you might need to deal with, like subject access, for example, it's worth keeping a record of um, whether you've dealt with subject access requests and, and so on. Um, and the important thing, and I, I think a lot of organisations have kind of forgotten this because we've not seen much traction and the ICO haven't been sort of showing their teeth in terms of uh, enforcement is that you're supposed to be compliant today, yesterday, last month, last year, next week, next month, next year, into the future until the law changes and you have to adapt your processes again. Um, so it's important that you maintain ongoing compliance and that's about uh, you know, making sure that people understand what a subject access looks like and that how they get dealt with internally right through to refreshing training, making sure you're processor due diligence is still up to date, that you've not started processing data that you didn't know about, so is your data audit report up to date and, and so on. So accountability has actually got quite a large uh, sort of uh, expectation of you, which is why, as I said at the early, earlier on, that the ICO have been making noises about um, um, accountability as being something that they want to focus on going forward. So we're um, we're closing into the end. Um, as I said, I want to try and get some um, uh, questions in at the end. Um, but I just wanted to do a quick thing about marketing data because this is one of the areas that's um, you know quite widely misunderstood. Um, so when it comes to the regulations in the UK, we have GDPR that sets out the data protection uh, laws, and we have the Data Protection Act 2018, and that says what you can and can't do, the lawful basis, individuals' rights, etc around processing personal data. Um, so the uh, GDPR, not the GDPA as it says on that slide, apologies, um, applies to all of your marketing data. So if you can identify an individual for some marketing data, data protection applies to that data and you shouldn't be worrying about GDPR in terms of security, etc. But the rules around what you can do with that data for the marketing data for the purposes of electronic marketing and the use of cookies is actually governed by an, uh, a regulation called the Privacy and Communi uh, sorry, Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations or PECA, which set out the e-marketing rules. And they dictate specifically the circumstances by which you need consent. So for example, if you're, if you're marketing to consumers, you must have consent before you send them um, cold emails, essentially. Um, but if you're marketing to B2B, to B, so you're marketing to businesses, as long as they're incorporated businesses, um, you don't need consent, for example. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding. But where you need consent, and this applies to cookies as well, so certain circumstances you need consent for cookies, you now need to apply GDPR level of uh, consent to your um, marketing activities as well. Um, I won't go through it, but um, I'll include it in the slide pack as, as I'm showing you here now. Um, here's a sort of a summary of um, the circumstances by which you would need consent or don't need consent. So when you see you need consent, that consent now needs to be GDPR compliant. So you have to be open and transparent and you have to be um, able to demonstrate that somebody gave you uh, an took an affirmative action to give you that consent. Uh, as I say, I won't go through that in detail because uh, we're running out of time, but um, it's in that pack. So you'll be able to uh, call upon that if you should need to. Um, Right, so to sort of wrap up, um, if you're looking at GDPR for the first time or you're thinking actually there's some stuff there that we haven't really 
uh, done in our organization then um, it's a summary of uh, 10 steps to compliance which you can, can apply so step one make sure somebody takes single point of responsibility um, within your organization for data protection and that may be a mandated data protection officer but most likely probably isn't and also make sure you're registered with the information commissioner's office they're making some noises again actually i saw this week a, a blog post saying that they're they're pursuing people who aren't registered with the ico that they think they ought to be um, and you have to be registered with the ico and pay a fee um, the the smallest fee is like 40 pound a month and the upper one is uh, i think it's about uh, it's, it's into the thousands i can't remember now i think it's close to two and a half three thousand pound a year um, and it's based on turnover a number of employees and the size of your business number two make sure you put in place training and policies so that everyone in your organization has a basic understanding of data protection they don't need to become gdpr experts but they should be able to spot things like a data breach to spot things like um, a subject access and understand what they can and can't do with data like if they take it home with them and, and that kind of thing um, number three make sure you have documented how you process data and um, what your lawful basis for processing is and so on uh, put in place privacy policies and make sure all of your data subjects are covered by privacy policies which is why it's useful to have your data audit to hand because you can identify the groups of data subjects and your date your privacy policy should really document each element of data subject and how you process their data and why it's lawful etc Carry out your third party due diligence and make sure you've got a contract or data processing agreement in place, uh, bearing in mind that the processor might have their own that they want you to sign as part of their terms of service. Um, make sure you've got processes in place for dealing with common compliance day-to-day -day stuff, so like dealing with breaches, subject access, when to carry out a data protection impact assessment and so on. Put in place a data retention policy and a schedule that says across your organization what data you keep for how long and how you destroy it afterwards. Um, so that means you need to understand what uh, the retention period should be. Um, know where your data is being processed because if it's being processed outside the EU, you've got to pay attention to those uh, restricted transfers. Um, and basically uh, rinse and repeat because you need to make sure that you're still compliant um, all of the time. Um, so you will need to regularly, probably once a year, refresh training um, like I was saying before, with ongoing compliance, check that your documents, policy documents are up to date, check that your data register is still reflective of the data you're processing and so on. Um, and then finally, keep up to date. Um, there's always guidance coming out. The Information Commission is not particularly good at shouting about new detailed guidance or enforcement actions and things like that. So uh, buried in enforcement actions and things called consensual audits, there's often some clues as to how the law is being uh, 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 considered and interpreted by the information commissioner and indeed you're supposed to look more widely because in theory if somebody enforces something in in france um then uh, there's a good chance that that enforcement action would apply in the way that is dealt with in the uk as well so you need to keep yourself up to date now if that all sounds like a lot of hard work then that's what the digital compliance hub is here for we can do some of this work for you um, but the primary core focus of our business is basically providing a, a, a advice and support helpline. Um, there's a subscription service, which is um, pay, um, which is a monthly subscription. You get unlimited email and phone support, as well as access to things like templates and tools and uh, other bits of guidance. Um, you can also uh, do pay as you go for ad hoc support. So if you um, so uh, you know if anything, if you think well one day I might need some help remember remember mark gracie in the digital compliance hub and there's a good chance we can help you even if it's just on a one-off thing on a on a ad hoc pay-as-you-go basis um and uh, we provide lots of other services as well outsource data protection um uh reviews audits um and and the like so um i hope that was useful um sorry i went on a bit longer than i um, was expecting to so uh, we haven't got much time for for questions um but um i can see we've got um quite a few questions come in so if you spare me a second i'll just quickly read them and uh and, and try and answer them um yeah so so chris is asking what prevents organizations always using legitimate interest as a lawful basis for processing is it seems to be a vague catch-all well i mean i think this is the problem with um legitimate interest um but the thing that stops organizations using legitimate interest is that lawful basis for processing is the fact that you're supposed to carry out a legitimate interest assessment and prove that it is the most appropriate lawful basis for processing 
Um, and as I said, if if uh, consent is your um, most appropriate lawful basis for processing, don't think you don't have to ask for consent. You might not like the answer um, and you rely on legitimate interest. Um, and you also need to bear in mind that if a law says you can't do this without consent, then you need to have consent. You can't claim you've got a legitimate interest to do it anyway. So a good example of that is um, if you're doing marketing, email marketing to consumers, you must have consent. The privacy rules tell you that you must have consent and therefore there is no excuse. You must have, you must rely on consent. It would also be ridiculous of you to say, well, I've got legitimate interest to process my customer's data for the purposes of delivering the service when there's a lawful basis that says process the data for the purposes of delivering the service. So um, it's, it's all about you proving, as is accountability principle, that you've chosen the right lawful basis for processing and be prepared to get told off if you've, if you've defaulted to legitimate interest. I, I certainly see lots of people who think they're processing under legitimate interest when they shouldn't be, um, and they probably don't have legitimate interest assessments either. Um, so I hope that answers that. Um, Right. Um, yeah. So another good question. How would you address individuals' rights in an example like receiving a business card at a trade event? So there's a number of things here. If somebody's giving you their business card, they, in theory, should know what it is that you're going to be doing with that business card. But presumably they've given you the business card for a particular purpose. So don't worry too much about necessarily having consent, but make sure that um, you understand the rules about what you're going to be doing with that um, business card. Um, and when it comes to individuals, if you, um, you know, if you take the business card and you leave it on your desk in a, in a, a messy pile and you couldn't easily find that business card, it's probably not covered by data protection. But if you take the data, scan it into, I don't know, Evernote, for example, allows you to scan business cards and stick it in Evernote and store it under the name of the person. You've then got a copy of the business card and that individual is entitled to all of their rights. So um, the bit about the right to be informed would be you know somebody understanding if it's obvious that somebody's saying here give me your card yes i am interested in you sending me an information pack that is pretty much as little as you can do with that information um strictly speaking you could market to them if they uh, are an incorporated business because the privacy rules allow you to um but they also have the subject access rights so they can you know business people um have uh, business data is as much um where it identifies an employee is that person's um, personal data, even though they're doing so as a, an employee. So all of the individual's rights still apply, I'm afraid. OK, uh, so question from Yvonne. Um, what's the minimum paperwork to have in place for a sole trader? Um, with under 20 clients, is a single policy document, a privacy statement sufficient? So the thing about data protection compliance is you have to prove that you've done everything you possibly could to be compliant. So um, the law with regards to documenting your processing activities, um, so for example, using the spreadsheet that the Information Commissioner used for conducting a data audit, um, or suggest you use as a template. Um, everybody has that requirement. The only difference is if you're under 250 employees, you only have to record um, regular processing activities. So if you, you know, so if you process data for a customer um, product delivery or service delivery, then you must record that you collect this data for those customers and this is what you do with it. Um, but if you once in a while um, send them an invoice once a year, send them an invoice or something, um, then that would probably not be something you would have to document. If you're over 250 employees, um, which obviously you're not in your case because you said under um, uh, uh, you're a sole trader, um, so um, but over 250 employees, just for information, they have to document everything, even um, odd processing um, and not sort of non regular processing. So um, I'm afraid it doesn't matter whether you're a sole trader or not, um, you have to have a good understanding of what your data is and just have that documented. And that can simply say, well, I process customer data, I do that through this system, um, and this is my lawful basis for processing, which would be if you're doing it for the purpose of delivering a service, um, then it would be uh, for the delivery of the service. Um, in terms of 
yeah, I mean, if you're a sole trader, you know, doing things like coming on this webinar helps you sort of address the training issue, the policy issue, you know, setting out a company policy that tells you what you can do and can't do with data protection is probably a slightly over the top. So you probably would need to have a data protection policy in place. Um, but uh, if you are doing things that require you to think about whether it's lawful for you to do the processing, it's always worth having that documentation to hand or having that written down. And that might be an exchange of emails um, or a, a note in a notebook or something like that. It doesn't matter what the documentation is in terms of how you do the documentation. It's just make sure that you've got something that, uh, that, that covers um, at, at the minimum, I guess, um, which is really what your question is, so sorry for <laughs> jabbering on and not directly answering your question. The minimum, I would say, have a data audit spreadsheet that is clear as to what your data um, points are and how you process the data. Have a privacy policy, probably on your website, um, that covers all of those data subjects, what happens if people visit your website, fill out forms, that kind of thing. Um, and just make sure that you're aware of what you can and can't do with data protection and certainly coming, like I say, coming to these kind of webinars uh, and uh, looking at the ICO's website, that kind of thing is probably, um, a, a, you know, addressing most of what you need to do. Um, but you will still have to deal with um, breaches if, if you cause one or you still have to deal with um, subject access requests if one of your clients asks you for one and um, you still need to think about retention, all these kind of things. So. You need to have a, a basic understanding of, of GDPR and uh, you need to sort of make sure that's implemented within your organisation. So I, I hope that kind of answers your question. And uh, unless there's any more coming through, I've got one more to answer. Um, the principles of GDPR are clear, but the interpretation could often be subjective. What steps should an organisation take to avoid becoming the subject of future case law to resolve such ambiguity? So, uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the common interpretation problem is around security and what is appropriate technological and organisational security, which is what the re regulation requires. But um, equally, yes, the other ones can be interpreted in lots of different ways. And indeed, GDPR can be interpreted in lots of different ways. Keeping on top of enforcement notices and what the ICO is saying and, and the advice and, and guidance that they're giving out, um, although sometimes can be quite vague, um, will help you keep on top of what it is that you should be doing interpreting wise. Um, when it comes to the crunch, it's left to you to, to prove that you thought you were doing the right thing. So uh, in, to a certain extent, unless you're obviously blatantly breaking the law um, and you should know, know better, um, you just need to be able to show, well, you know, our best effort was we have implemented this particular process to deal with this and you know, the ICA might tell you, well, actually, it's not good enough. You need to do these things. And if you suffer a breach, they might give you some recommendations of what you need to do. But it doesn't automatically mean you'll get a penalty or a fine or, 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 or um, something like that. I think the key underlying thing for any organisation is show that you have at least paid attention to GDPR and done your best within your organisation. So sort of going back to that previous question about being a sole trader, you know, a lot of what you need to do is going to be um, minimal because you've only got 20 clients or um, you're just a sole trader. So the risk is much different as well because it's a, a very much a risk exercise. Um, and uh, but if you're processing hundreds of thousands of customers and their consumers that, um, rather than B2B, then um, then that risk is is much, um, much, uh, much bigger as, um, in, in comparison. Um, and, and that's the I think. If, you, if there is a problem with GDPR, I'd say that's the problem with GDPR. It's also the problem with using the Information Commissioner's uh, helpline because they will never give you definitive answers or very rarely do, um, because ultimately you've got to prove you've done the right thing. Um, and that comes down to the principles and individuals' rights and, and everything else as well. So when we talk about, you know, well, I'm going to rely on legitimate interest for this lawful um, processing, um, you've got to demonstrate why you thought legitimate interest was the right approach and you might get it wrong but if you've at least demonstrated why you thought you got it right um, then you should be okay. Um, likewise for security um, you know you can go to the nth degree and the example I use is if you've got a laptop with personal data on it and at the end of the day you lock it in a filing cabinet inside a locked office inside a locked building you probably don't need to pay for a security guard to stand outside just to make sure that nobody tries to break in because you've got all of those steps of security in place. 
But if you take work home with you and somebody else uses the computer and accesses the data and sees it, and that is potentially a breach, or if your computer gets stolen or you leave it on a bot, uh, on a bus or um, uh, leave it lying around somewhere and somebody steals it from you, how can you demonstrate that that uh, data on there is not going to be accessed? Um, and you would have to say, well, it's because the hard drive's encrypted. Oh, sorry, I've got a password lock on my Windows. Well, if somebody can crack that because it's ABC123, then that wouldn't be sufficient. But if it was a complicated password and difficult to crack, then um, then that's one step. But what if they took the hard drive out and plugged it into another computer? Could they still access the data? And if they could, then you should be thinking about encryption and, and so on. And so that sort of is a bit of an hard, hard question to answer, but um, that was, uh, yeah, hopefully that was, was helpful. Um, so we've gone way past the one o'clock ending. Um, so apologies for that. Um, thank you for the questions. Um, thank you for um, joining the webinar today. I hope you found it useful. I will follow up with a copy of the slides and also a uh, link to the recording. Um, if there's any questions you wish you'd asked but had forgotten or didn't think about them at the time, then feel free to drop me an email and I'll endeavour to um, answer them. Um, and of course, uh, more than happy to have a conversation if there's something you need uh, particularly help with. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have good weekends and uh, hopefully uh, speak soon and uh, good luck with your GDPR if you're looking at it for the first time.